Earlier this week, police and private security surrounded a park in downtown Toronto. After a few tense hours between protesters and city authorities, the encampment where people had been living during the pandemic was cleared. It's been decried by many, but defended by the mayor. Let's find out more. With us now, all in the provincial capital, Michael Thompson, Toronto City Councillor representing Scarborough Centre, Deputy Mayor for the East Area of the City, and the Chair of Toronto's Economic and Community Development Committee that oversees shelters. Lorraine Lamb, an outreach worker at Sanctuary Toronto, and Joe Harmer, Professor of Sociology at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Hi, it's nice to see all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just to get us into our conversation, I wanted to show you some pictures from the situation that transpired in Trinity Bellwoods Park on Tuesday. Uh, the first picture, for those who are listening to podcast, um, there was a large police presence uh, was brought in to evict roughly a couple dozen people who have been living in the park during the pandemic. And then we have uh, another picture with police and private security forces clash with protesters on site. There you see a fence separating protesters and the police from city workers and those in the encampment, um, and several arrests were made, including a journalist. Um, I wanted to um, get a response from all of you of what you think when you see all those pictures and what you made of the whole scene. Uh, Lorraine, I'd like to start with you. I'm really troubled by what happened on Tuesday. It was really violent, and to me, it felt like an overuse of force for about 25 to 30 residents in the park. And I'm really aware that the language has been about protesters versus the city. And I have to name that a lot of the residents actually had asked for people who they have trusted relationships with to show up to support them. So I actually think that a number of us who were there, I personally was there from five in the morning and we are we were there as supporters of people we know and care about. Um, I think too that, you know, the city's messaging is that all of these um, security and police showed up after they saw the large crowds. But I personally have time-stamped photos and videos showing that at five o'clock these large uh, police forces were already present. I I just think that you know people are living in encampments because it's their only option, and to see the city come down so hard, um, you would think that this was some angry biker gang or something about to incite this crazy war or something, but that was not the case. So I'm pretty disappointed by. By the city's response to Tuesday and, and some of their messaging afterwards. And Deputy Mayor, uh, we appreciate you being here because you are here to speak on behalf of the city. Lorraine said that the people who were there were there to support the people in the encampment. When you look at those pictures as somebody who represents the city on a national stage, uh, what goes through your mind? Well, uh, you know, this has been a very difficult situation all around. It's been complicated with um, the complexity of homelessness and the challenges that people are faced. Uh, clearly, the police and our city um, enforcement officers and, uh, and others who worked in this uh, encampment to address the issue there um, prepared a game plan in order to do everything in an orderly, safe way to protect everyone, those who are advocates, those who are people in the encampment area, as well as the staff. And so they determined the type of um, you know, personnel that were needed. And as I understood it, there were no injuries. There were some uh, arrests. There were some people arrested and were released. And the efforts to address the issue around clearing the encampment was successful. And I think that it's important to understand what we were trying to do as a city, which is to provide shelter and, and safe uh, uh, space for those individuals. We have removed um, approximately 1,700 individuals and put them into safe place where they've got shelter, food, clean laundry, uh, dealing with uh, mental health issues as some of the people have. We provided services to them. We've provided additional hotel capacity and so on. So a lot of work is actually being done by the city. And the work that was, um, you know, um, that took place with respect to the police and security personnel was necessary to protect everyone involved. Um, you said that the, the police was to protect uh, the people there. Um, Lorraine mentioned it was uh, maybe 20 to 25 um, in, uh, tents that were there. Um, when you look at those pictures, do you not get a sense of uh, it's uh, disproportionate? You know, what are you keeping, who are you keeping safe and who are you keeping safe, safe from? 
Sure, as I understand it, and we've seen before, there was um, an interaction with the police and advocates and others who basically um, attacked some of our own personnel. We've had some of our city staff been spat on, uh, things have been thrown at them, uh, they have been threatened, and so obviously the police were there to keep the peace. As I see the photo, I see a photo of a group of police officers and so on, but I also know that it's a big space, so when you show a photograph with respect to a more contained area, I mean, it may show a disproportional, disproportional sort of, um, you know, perspective. But at the end of the day, the police were there to ensure that everyone was safe. Lorraine, I do see your, I do see your hand. I'm going to come to you, but I really do want to uh, get a reaction from Joe of those pictures. Uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I'm glad to hear, uh, you know, the councillor talk about this as a complicated issue. I don't think there should have been a game plan at all. I don't think the police should have been there at all. I, I thought it was an unjustified and bizarre police operation. It, it wasn't just targeting uh, the 20 to 25 encampment residents who were there. I think it was also meant to uh, intimidate uh, supporters uh, of, uh, of the encampment residents. And, you know, I I really think it's just perverse to talk about this in in, in terms of a, a, a compassionate police operation or something to do with with human rights. This is just uh, you know absolutely the the wrong way uh, to deal with these situations in terms of the welfare of the encampment residents, and in many cases pushes people into more dangerous and risky situations. But you know this should be considered uh, a, a space in which uh, people need to survive at the end of a global pandemic. It shouldn't be uh, just represented as a type of crime scene that should be uh, destroyed. These are these are people's homes trying to uh, uh, trying to survive as best they can under extremely difficult circumstances. And they're there because of the inadequacy of the shelter system and the fact that uh, encampment residents tend to be the most vulnerable uh, and often the most victimized uh, in the homeless population. Um, we're going to talk more about uh, the this, this shelter situation in the city in just a few moments. But Joe, I just wanted to follow up with something that you said. You said this is the wrong way. Um, what would be the right way? The right way is to continue uh, long-term sustained uh, outreach work that builds relationships with encampment residents, that listens to them, uh, usually with, uh, with, uh, with, with peer workers, people that, that have shared experience with the encampment residents that sort of speak their language. And that is the only way to do that, to get, uh, to get residents into, uh, into uh, secure housing if it's available and so on. Um, encampment residents and homeless people generally have a great distrust of authority of the police. Their experience generally is very negative with the police, often for a very good reason. And long-term sustained outreach work uh, carried out by peers is, is really the only way to go. When you have policing as a default option, like Toronto has, it essentially contaminates and ruins a lot of outreach efforts because in the end, uh, everyone knows that the sort of that the stick of the police is there to use. So I think, except under very exceptional circumstances, uh, the police should not be involved. And Lorraine, I know you wanted to um, follow up with something that the deputy mayor said. Yeah, so I, I totally agree that this is a really complex issue with so many layers and complications. Um, but I think it's interesting. So, um, deputy mayor, you mentioned that like the goal of the day was achieved. And so I think if the goal of the day was to clear the encampments from the park, yes, um, there are currently no more tents left in Bellwoods. However, I know for a fact that um, all of the people there didn't actually get permanent housing. A bunch of people actually just relocated to different parks. Um, and I think the reality too is Sergeant um, Bernardo told me at about six in the morning that the cops were there to support the security because the security weren't trained. Um, and so I think that's concerning as well. And I also think that Trinity Bowes is a really large park. And so this was contained in just the north and south ends, but the rest of the park was very, very peaceful. There were lots of people playing and riding their bikes. And I think when we talk about safety, I can speak very honestly and, and I can tell you about the women that I was supporting. There were three women in particular that I was connecting with throughout the day and they were so traumatized. And me being there all day, like the pepper spray did not make me feel safe. The riot mounted police did not make me feel safe. So I think this language of safety, like I, 
I definitely have questions about it. And and I think that, you know, when we talk about getting people inside the shelter system, and I know we're going to talk about this, but I think that, you know, yes, people might have a roof over their head, but there's, you know, laundry is not done on site. It's an outside place that does it. So people have lost laundry. A number of people I know in these spaces have not met a single housing worker because there's not enough workers and there's no housing. And so I think there's this idea of what's inside these shelter spaces, but the reality is that's not actually what's happening um, because it's just understaffed. And so I don't think we can, you know, talk about this idealistic shelter as if that's actually what's happening because it's actually not. Uh, and Deputy Mayor, you know, I just wanted to follow up with with that because throughout the pandemic, we've been telling um, each other that we're in this together. The pandemic has turned a lot of people's lives upside down. Um, you know, and we've talked about public spaces, uh, especially parks, people having access to them. Um, what message do you, you feel this situation sent in, ter in terms of Toronto's parks and who they're for? So the parks are for everyone. And we've had a lot of complaints from the general public about the encampments. And the question is, what is the city doing about it? And so as both the guests have indicated that the shelter system, obviously some people have concern with them. We have concerns with them as well and we're trying to make them better. To date, we have spent about $663 million uh, trying to address this issue. We have also got additional hotel space to provide um, you know, uh, facilities for those in need. And the staff have actually been working for months now with respect to those in encampment to deal with issues, personal and mental issues, trying to also develop a housing accommodation plan for them. So to the point that Joe has made with respect to spend more time with people in the encampment, trying to work with them, we have done so. We feel that as we now are into the summer months, there's a need to deal with the issue that's in front of us, which is to provide space for people, at the same time clearing the encampments in our park so more residents can have access to the parks. The parks are not designed for place for, uh, for people to live in. Well, I'm just, when you when you were talking about the money and you're talking about the sure. camps and um, about the hotels, my understanding is that, you know, as soon as the pandemic is done, those uh, hotel spaces will not be available. And Lorraine mentioned, you know, uh, with the encampments, there's something called community. We all should have a right to community. So I just wanted to ask you the why. Why do you think that people would rather be in the encampment than go to these shelters that you say you've spent a lot of money uh, putting into? So we have seen with respect to the numbers, we've seen that about 40% of the people that are actually in the encampment are actually new to the environment of the shelter services. So we as a city are working diligently. We've got a number of projects on the way right now. One of the things that we have coming on stream, which we have about 82 projects that will provide about 10,676 new housing facilities to address the issue. As you know, it does take some time in order for us to build and to provide these accommodation. In the interim, we're doing the best that we can. I don't believe that the shelter system is the best thing. I think a permanent housing is the best solution. In the interim, we're actually working with respect to a variety of different models to accommodate the need. The need continues to grow. We have people from all over the province and elsewhere coming to Toronto because of the fact of our system. I know, we know that the system is not perfect, but we're working really hard in terms of addressing. Again, I reiterated, since uh, April of last year, we have been able to relocate about 1,700 people from the encampments to be able to help them. Okay, Joe, I wanted to bring you in on it. What are the safety concerns around shelters? To go to people in encampments and say we have shelter space for you uh, is, is, is not a solution because essentially they've been banned or forced out of shelters or they've simply find shelters to be intolerable. 
uh, one of the central problems with shelters is the isolation uh, that uh, that uh, the people have experienced, which uh, can be devastating for some uh, some residents. It can also be, in terms of the context of the overdose crisis, it can be deadly. I mean, isolation uh, can uh, can kill uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, so you know, uh, I think in terms of you know what the councillor has said, I, I think what bothers me. Uh, and I think it's, you know, we should talk about more is the fact that he's, you know, says that there's been outreach work and we've done this sort of thing, but all of a sudden we stop because it's summertime because people want to use the parks. And it, it does bring up the fundamental question about, uh, you know, who are the parks for? I mean, Kyrgyz City thinks the parks are for people like you and I with comfortable incomes and lives who want to, you know, have a glass of wine and, and, and have dinner or for people in leisure activities and so on. What's very clear from the mayor is that the parks are not uh, for people who need them for survival space. Encampments are uh, the uh, are they, uh, the sort of last chance survival space uh, for many unhoused uh, in individuals. And uh, it's, it's very clear the city doesn't think that, that parks uh, uh, that those people have any claim to park space at all. I find that, you know, deeply undemocratic. And I really wonder if we can be proud of a city that actually enforces that distinction, enforces that exclusion with the type of raw police power uh, that we saw. Um, and, and just one other point I want to make is I think one of the, the real tragedy about Tuesday is that I think that type of police operation, that type of, you know, ridiculous overkill, um, the type of, uh, of, you know, dramatization of sort of paramilitary police power in different types of ways, I think is going to badly or perhaps permanently damage uh, city efforts in the future to carry out further outreach work. I think when the, when the, when the city does try and convince encampment residents, and there will be more uh, encampments, this is not a problem that's going to go away, uh, uh, they're going to have a very difficult time because encampment residents will not trust them uh, and uh, and uh, will not trust them. And I think uh, I think there's a lot of clam uh, collateral damage we're going to be seeing in the future, even if there is secure housing available. It's going to be very hard now to build trusting relationships and get encampment residents into proper secure housing. Uh, so I think really, I think that's really, really one of the tragic aspects. And uh, again, I, you know, I really would hope that the mayor and the council rethinks this sort of crime control approach. It's really going to be counterproductive in the long term. Uh, Lorraine, you know, we saw uh, police, we saw a lot of police, we saw mounted police, we saw uh, private security on Tuesday. Um, how does the cost of this sort of operation compare to the cost needed to provide some long-term housing solutions for those who were living in Trinity Bellwoods? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I wanted to go back to, like, I think we also saw a huge group of, um, like, anti-lockdown protesters descend on Bellwoods, and there was just a few bike cops present um, when those protests were happening. I, I also wanted to come back to the shelter reality. I Last night I was on the phone with a with a 22-year-old who was placed in the shelter with a stranger, and he was terrified, um, understandably. Um, I lost my friend Roxy last month in the hotel shelter, and the month before I lost my friend Mel. We're grieving a lot of people who are dying in these hotel shelter spaces because they're not adequately set up. And a number of us have actually spoken to the city to say, if these are, if these are going to be set up, we need to have certain things in place. And that was not listened to. And Councillor, I really appreciate that you mentioned that like there's so many people that are new to the system right now because, like. Homelessness is on the rise, and this is not the solution. And I also understand that, like, housing takes time, but you know, it, it, it takes time. But then, what what do we do? And there's so many people that are becoming hopeless, and yet the solutions are so slow moving. And one of the suggestions that was put forward by Councillor Matlow at City Council a couple weeks ago was that we should actually have a lived experience advisory board to consult with how shelters can be made better. And that was voted down again. So I. I I hear what you're saying about, you know, the city's working to try to find ways to make the shelter system better, but yet the motion was voted against. So I'm having a hard time understanding why that was the case. But back to the shelter costs, um, the the cost of one 
shelter hotel bed right now is six thousand dollars a month per person um that that money like i that can be rent supplements for people for permanent housing if if there was access to permanent housing and then when we were talking about tuesday i counted at about 6 30 i counted about 50 police officers um in the parking lot of the community center so all of that salary multiplied by the course of the day and there was way more than 50 police officers that were there so you know, if we do the math there and then the private security and then the corporate security and then the various city staff and then the park staff, um, I think there could have been up to about $250,000 spent that day on trying to enforce this clearing of the encampment. That is a lot of money. <laughs> I want to give you uh, an opportunity to respond, Deputy Mayor, but before I do that, I just wanted to read uh, some uh, tweets that were sent out by your colleagues. Um, you know, uh, the mayor has said this was a, a reasonable uh, response, but um, other Toronto councillors disagreed with the approach taken and the justifications made. Uh, we have a tweet here from Josh Matlow uh, in response to Mayor John Tory calling the Trinity Bellwoods Park encampment evictions reasonable, firm, by compassion. Passionate. Councillor Josh Matlow tweeted the following. I disagree with Mayor Tory. Encampments cannot remain forever, but the approach the city took yesterday was neither reasonable or compassionate. It was wrong. Root issues including housing, safety and shelters, and for some, access to mental health must be addressed. Uh, another one from Joe Cressy, Councillor Joe Cressy, whose ward includes Trinity Bellwoods, and he wrote, ending chronic homelessness, not simply clearing encampments, that must be our collective task. Encampments are not a solution to chronic homelessness, neither is simply clearing them. And another one from Councillor Mike Layton, and he shared, I know from speaking with residents that they do not feel safe in the city's current offerings. Council has not done enough to build trust and ensure safety of residents in housing. Deputy Mayor, um, is there anything your fellow colleagues said there that you disagree with? The um, city has been working to ensure that our consideration for the health and welfare and well-being for those who are living outside are being addressed. I think a broader application with respect to how we deal with these issues are actually being worked on by a variety of uh, people, uh, NGOs and city staff. I know that it's easy to make comments with respect to the situation. Um, however, we have all been working in a way to try to facilitate a response in a holistic, healthy way to help those who are experiencing homelessness in our city, along with addiction, mental health issues, and so on. The city has been working with respect to partners and agencies to trying to find solutions to provide safe, housing and accommodation for those who are in need. We've seen an influx with respect to those who are experiencing homelessness and so on as a result of the pandemic. And of course, this started well before it. I don't know if you remember some 20 years ago or so, we had the big tent city down at Parliament and Lakeshore. We had to address the situation there. We continue to build based on experiences and, and things that we're learning. And while we may not have it perfect at this point in time, we are working through to address the issue that require us to ensure that people are safe in the accommodations that we provide to them. That's a goal of the city council. That's a goal of the city staff. And I think that's a goal for most people living in this city, wanting to deal with a very difficult situation. And Toronto has become the Mecca where people come because we have services and we are trying to respond and we have a number of, as I mentioned earlier on, permanent housing that are coming on stream. We have communities now that are accepting modular homes and within that there are issues, but we're working through those because Torontonians are aware that we must do more to help those who are experiencing homelessness. And we have a long way to go and we have an opportunity to work with all those who have an interest in 
dealing with this very complicated and complex issue. Uh, Lorraine, I have uh, about a minute left. We've been hearing um, this is a very complicated situation. Uh, we've, we've heard about safety. Um, but I guess that we should remember that this is concerning people's lives who need immediate action. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, there seems to be uh, a division between how the council's uh, approaching it if you live in urban or suburban areas. Uh, how do you think that's going to impede progress around this discussion? Yeah, the current council setup feels to me like there's sort of the the councillors who represent the, the urban and then there's the suburban. And myself, I grew up in the John Valley North riding, so I understand that the realities of what the councillors are are focusing on there are very different from what the downtown councillors are, are voting for. And therefore, um, when city council is pushing forward motions, the votes will play out very differently. Um, so I think that if we don't look out for the most vulnerable communities amongst us, we're not really all in this together. Um, most of us are a couple paychecks away from being in the encampment from needing a washroom in the park that was almost voted against. Um, again, like I think when I observed city council that day, those who voted against, you know, washrooms in the parks were those who were not in the urban core, were those who were sort of more removed from, from the downtown space. And so these decisions are affecting a lot of really vulnerable people. And so I do think that, you know, urban and not urban councillor representation is, is clearly causing a fallout that's affecting some of our really vulnerable people. I think that even if, and I, I'm not saying that this is the case, but I think even if people did not care about homeless people at all, the financial cost it is to support people who are homeless is one that we all carry. Um, so I think it's really important that we actually consider decisions that will be long-term, um, that are actually sustainable because the actions from Tuesday merely displaced people from one park to another park. And I know that for sure. Um, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your time, Lorraine and Deputy Mayor. Thank you for being here uh, on behalf of the city. And Joe, I wish we were able to talk about uh, the COVID-19 policing on homeless initiative that you're working on. I encourage people to look it up. Um, thank you all so much for your time. We really do appreciate your insights. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.